professor of human evolutionary biology at Harvard University. Um, I'd like introductions that begin kind of a personal funny story. I actually don't know Joe that well. <laughs> so, but fortunately, yesterday, I bumped into somebody who works in, as a, a postdoc at the Stephen Weir's lab who does know him and didn't work with him at UBC. So I said, um, can you tell me a funny story about him? And she said, oh, he's a terrifically generous person, one of the kindest people I've ever met, and a wonderful you know, advisor. And that was no help at all. <laughs> so, so it was pretty useless. Um, so what I'll do is I'll stick to an intellectual introduction, but I'll make it personal by inserting irrelevant facts about myself. <laughs> and in general, I'm not going to go over his many awards and accomplishments. I just want to get some high points. So first, I was a fan of Joe Henry before he became <laughs> relatively, relatively early in his career, it's like, it's like these bands, you know, I followed this band before everyone else. <laughs> um, and and, and the, the thing which caught my attention from the beginning, catch many people's attention, was his work on prestige. His, his really rich theoretical analysis of prestige, how it differs from, um, from dominance, and the role it plays in cultural evolution, and cultural development, and developmental psychology. And, uh, and this work was sort of theoretically rich, it was theoretically clever, it was just amazing, and it's a work he continues to this day. In, uh, in 2007, he co-authored a book with, with Natalie Henrik on uh, why humans cooperate, which I think is one of her classics in our field. And you know, it reviews all of the standard stuff you'd expect it to review, but it dives into a tremendous detail, things which people have forgotten about, literature as a developmental psychology and social psychology that just got, got missed. And it's Incredibly cool book. Um, most of all, my big connection with him was, was in 2010, he was first author of a paper uh, that I published in a journal like Poetic Behavioral and Brain Sciences called The Weirdest People in the World. And I bet most people in the have either read the paper or have heard of it or have had their work influenced by it. So at the most superficial level, this paper coined a new word, weird, a new acronym. <laughs> Which is going to get this Western educated industrialized rich democracy. Rich and democratic. Rich and uh, rich and yeah. I like my rich and better. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, and it was, you know, and, and, and the claim in this article was we are all doing it wrong. That, that basically so much of our field, so much of the work of, of me and people in this room, uh, in psychology, in, in allied disciplines, social psychology, have focused all of their attention on it fairly narrow subset of humanity, that is us, um, and develop the science of us, missing the fact that, 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 that we're neglecting most humans who have ever lived and most humans who live now, and backing us up with a huge body of empirical work, so much of it your own, um, that, that, um, that shows that actually a lot of what we see in these weird societies don't hold universal. Phenomena ranging from language, memory, social categorization, prejudice, causal reasoning, you name it, there's evidence that the story's going to be a lot more complicated and nuanced. Um, and, um, and, and I'll tell you, I haven't actually done the stats, but my gut feeling is this is the most significant, most cited, most well known article ever published in the day of that time. Um, so, his most recent book, The Secret of Our Success, um, asked, was probably the biggest question of all, which is how do we explain us? How do we explain that we have language and, and culture and buildings and conferences and, and relationships and, and technology and all of these things that distinguish us from every other creature uh, on Earth? And where does this come from? And to, this is, to answer this question is an extraordinarily ambitious project. And, um, and, and, and the book and, and, and uh, the talk which is going to come, is going to be unusual in its creativity and depth. Uh, to, to address these questions, you have to have a grasp of, of it. domains like climatology, evolutionary theory, sociology, linguistics, and so on. And you must be comfortable in conversing and moving across these domains to integrate them and build, and build a theory. Um, there can't be more than a handful of scholars on Earth who could do such a thing. Um, and Joe Henry is one of them. So, so we'll be
up, Paul, although you kind of set me up there. You were so entertaining and uh, fun for the audience. I'm not sure I'm going to be able to live up to that. Uh, but, but thank you. Um, OK, so today I want to spend my time talking about uh, this book, which recently came out. I have to apologize for some of you, because I've been talking about my book a lot. And some of you may have already seen uh, versions of this, although I pepper in different things each time. So maybe there'll be some for you if you've already seen this. Um, so I, first, I'm going to go through the key points that I want to get to by the end. And actually, going to start off with the very last point. So throughout this talk, I'm going to be gradually building up the case that to think about humans, to understand the nature of our species, the nature of our psychology, our physiology, and our anatomy, we have to consider that human genetic evolution has been driven by cultural evolution. That we have a second system of inheritance that became intertwined with genetic evolution and is actually responsible for a whole bunch of important aspects of the human phenotype. So the standard model of just taking genetic evolution and then inferring a behavior or inferring an evolved psychology, this is important. But it's insufficient to explain uh, the innate aspects of human psychology, let alone the immense cultural diversity that we find across the world. Uh, or just simply extending that evolved psychology that comes from genetic evolution to culture is an important part of the process, but there's a big feedback loop that goes from the culture that's created by our evolved psychology and then subsequently shapes lots of aspects of our species. And the book is very much a compendium of examples of, of those kinds of things. So the first thing I want to convince you of is that we're a cultural species, that we've gone off on a different evolutionary trajectory from the rest of nature because of the interaction between our genetic and cultural <coughs> systems. So this has made us unlike other species. So we're dependent on an immense body of ideas, beliefs, values, and practices, ways of thinking, ways of processing information that other species don't rely on for their very survival. And I'll give you some examples of that. Um, now to get at this, we want to dissolve the intellectually destructive dichotomy between cultural explanations on the one hand and evolutionary explanations on the other. And we're going to take the power of natural selection uh, and of evolutionary theorizing that has been so powerful in understanding the rest of the natural world and apply it to the question of learning. How is it that humans are able to look out into our social milieu and extract valuable information from the minds and behaviors from other members of our, our social groups? So we're going to explain our adaptations for culture uh, using evolutionary theory and then take the next step. And this is going to give rise to all kinds of emerging phenomena. So it's going to give rise to something I call the collective brain. This means that humans really think as groups over generations. And you'll see what I mean by that. That we produce fancy tools and complex technology that no single individual actually invents or could invent in their lifetimes. And that's true of uh, the modern world, of course, but it's also true of uh, we produce complex languages that are emerging products of this interaction and social institutions. And all of these eventually feed back and have influenced our genetic evolution. And then what all this means, and I'm not going to spend any time on this, although I go in the book, is that culture is part of our biology in two separate ways. The first way is that, as I've been suggesting, culture evolution has shaped our genetic evolution. So we've become adapted to being a cultural species, to depending on this information, this body of know-how that's out in the world. But it also Cultural systems also shape our brains. So even without any genetic evolution, people who grow up in different societies have different brains. Their hormones respond in different ways. They maintain different levels of testosterone, for example, due to the cultural institutions that have been constructed in different ways. OK, so I think the way to get into this is to let me lay out a puzzle for you. But it's a, it's a puzzle that most people <coughs> haven't quite problematized. Uh, because we think we have a solution to it. Now I'm going to spend some time questioning the solution. So the puzzle is that long before the origins of agricultural, the first cities, or uh, especially before the age of industrial technology, humans as hunter-gatherers spread out across the globe. Beginning from Africa, we're actually into, uh, well, into the Arctic by 40,000 years ago. This is out of date now. Um, humans moved into Europe sometime after 50,000 years ago, all the way to Australia sometime after 60,000 years ago. So we have the arid deserts of Australia and the frozen tundra of the Arctic and then to the malarial swamps of New Guinea by 40,000 years ago, and then eventually the New World all the way down to Chile, the tip of Tierra del Fuego, all before the origins of agriculture. And during this vast expansion, we enter an immense range of different environments. I mentioned some of them, the Arctic and the arid deserts, the malarial swamps. And if you look at how humans have adapted to those environments, we've done it different from other species. So we have very few environmental-specific genetic adaptations. But if you compare us to another, the, the other most ecologically successful species, I mean, the inverted rates in this case, ants, 
they've done it the old-fashioned way. And it's speciated into over 14,000 different species. So they have particular environment-specific genetic adaptations which allow them to adapt to all these diverse environments. But we've done it without that. So the question is, how have we done it? And the typical answer that you get, I think if you consult common sense clearly, you just ask people, it's because we're smart. So we have great big brains, we can figure out solutions to problems, so we just kind of power up the, the big machinery and we come up with the answers. So the first thing I want to do is try to convince you that that's not the correct answer. And now I'll go on to give you, give you what I think is the correct answer. So to do that, I'm going to start by getting into the, the lost European explorer files. This actually includes one good American case, but I'm going to give you a, a Euro, lost European explorer case uh, from the Burke and Wills expedition. So it's 1860 and it's Australia. So Europeans have colonized the coast of Australia. And Burke and Wills are two explorers who put together a team which is going to attempt to be the first to journey across the interior of Australia. So they're going to go from Melbourne in the south all the way up to the Gulf of Carpentaria, and then uh, their, their goal is to get back, but the, the part of the story is that they don't make it. After about 12 weeks, they're on their way back from the Gulf of Carpentaria, uh, and they run out of food. So they have to begin living off the land. Some of their camels escape. Uh, but they're able to live on some of their pack animals, they're, they're able to get a little bit of food along the way. But they eventually drag into this place in the center here. Uh, it's not good. <coughs> uh, called Cooper's Creek. And they don't know what to do, but they're able to replenish their supplies uh, there. So they decide that they're going to make a last ditch effort to survive by heading 150 kilometers to the west. And they can follow Cooper's Creek along the way, and there's a ranch and a police post there. And it's prophetically at a place called Mount Hopeless. <laughs> so they, they start heading towards Mount Hopeless along Cooper's Creek. Their last, their last camel dies in the mud. And so they're effectively stranded along Cooper's Creek. Because at the end of the Cooper's Creek part of the journey, there's open desert. And they don't know how to find water in the open desert. So they're, they're, kind, they're just marooning. And, and things aren't looking good. So first, they can't catch fish or hunt. They don't know which plants to eat. Um, However, they begin meeting up with some of the locals, and from the locals, they're able to get gifts of fish. The locals don't seem to have any problem catching fish. And they notice the locals, the women, are processing uh, a squirrel carp, it looks like a seed to them, uh, called nardu. And they're able to eventually find some of the seeds, and they, they process it, so they're able to make bread, and they begin eating it. So it looks like they might be able to make it. They're getting the occasional gifts of fish, they're uh, making these, these cakes, and they're eating them. Uh, but, so here's a picture of the, the Nardu, the squirrel carp. But the problem was that they didn't notice something when they were in the aboriginal camps. It's that there's a, uh, a, an intensive process that the Nardu goes through. So first it's grinding, and then it's leached. So it's run through by water, and it's let sit. And in one case it's heated and only, only eaten with a mussel shell. And in the other case, it's grinded, leached, baked, and then baked in ash. And both of these detoxify Nardu, because unless it's properly processed, this sporo part is both indigestible, so it just passes through you, and toxic. It has, a, has a, an enzyme called thymine, which depletes the B1 in your body, and you eventually die of a horrible disease called peritonitis. So Burke and Wills eventually perish from this disease, and William Wills is actually writing in his journal right up until the end, and you eventually recapture the journal. Uh, you can actually read it online. Um, and King, the third member of the party, stumbles off into the outback and is eventually rescued by the Yuanshu tribe. And then eventually a rescue party comes from Melbourne. And so this is how we have the story. So this is a case where these guys had 12 weeks to get used to this continent of hunter-gatherers where humans have lived for 60,000 years, but they couldn't do the basic things. They couldn't figure out how to find, find water or food. They were frantic they couldn't find water. Um, so you know, there's no general intelligence, no modules fired up, no instincts allowed them to survive. Now, you might think, uh, that this is asking too much to just ask these guys to survive in the desert. Uh, maybe other animals can do that either. But we have the control case, the camels. Remember I mentioned the camels escaped? Well, the central part of Australia is now covered with feral camels. The <laughs> 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 lost European explorer case, because camels have instincts to sniff out water, and they can actually have taste cues that allow them to hone in on plants uh, that have are high in protein, and they have heavy digestive machinery that allows them to detoxify plants the way lots of animals have that humans lost. So, uh, vertebrates couldn't do these basic things like find water or hunt effect. 
effectively. One of the things they didn't know how to do that's basic to survival in Australia is what this plant is. This is a plant called Spiniflex. And I like it because it's kind of an unsuspecting looking plant. It doesn't look very useful. But it turns out the plant has crystals on the leaves, which if you bang it for a while and you knock the crystals off, and then you mix it with kangaroo dust and then heat it, you can make a, uh, a resin that allows you to make tools. And once it hardens, you can mold it. And then it hardens, it's, it's as hard as cement. So this is one of the main tools that Australian Aborigines use to make tools. But of course, Bourbon Wills didn't know about that. So this is a piece of information that one that's really useful uh, in this environment. Any local adolescent would have known these things, but Bourbon Wills couldn't figure, figure it out. So you can ask the question, why couldn't they survive uh, in these undergather environments? And the answer is that they didn't get this massive download of cultural information that the local adolescents would have had. It would have allowed them to cross through the desert and, and find water. I put a picture of some uh, Aboriginal water containers up there. OK. So that suggests that you know, there's something special about humans. We can't survive in environments in which we evolve. And we rely on this large body of cultural information that we can't figure out, even when we're under pressure or our lives are on the line. Um, so the book has a number of different cases that come at that, that problem from different angles. But let me now come at this from a different angle and go to the work of uh, Esther Herman and Mike Tom Sello at the Max Planck Institute and uh, just give you a glance at some experimental work they did with uh, three kinds of primates. So these two and a half year old German children, uh, chimpanzees and orangutans, and they gave them a, a battery of 18 cognitive tests. And the cognitive tests can be subdivided into um, tests about space, about how you can solve spatial problems, problems about quantity, causality, which includes tool using, and social learning. Now, uh, there's, the species are incentivized to perform in these tests, so all three species like snacks. And, uh, uh, but, and you can see that the chimpanzees and the humans are pretty similar across these tasks. Not very much different. The orangs are lagging a little bit, but not much. Um, so the orangs aren't doing too bad, except in the social learning task. So it's actually hard to find social learning tasks where the kids aren't at ceiling because kids are such great imitators, and the apes aren't at floor. So when you look at our basic cognitive abilities that we have as two and a half year old children, it's not very much that different from apes. Now, one thing that's important about this, and a question people often ask, is how come uh, we don't use adults in the task? Well, if you put adult humans in this and compare them up against these, these apes of various ages, uh, we would find that the adult humans would blow the roof off the task. They'd be at ceiling on everything. But interestingly, humans continue getting better at these cognitive tasks for, for at least two decades, whereas the apes are as good as they're going to get by around age four or five, and then they're flat. So something about humans allows us to keep building up uh, more and more impressive uh, positive abilities over time. It's worth no noting that uh, recent comparative research suggests that the German children are probably relatively bad at observational learning compared to uh, children in small-scale societies. It's the work of Christine. OK, uh, a couple other things I review in the book that I don't have time to go into is we're comparing the working memories of chimpanzees and humans. The chimps do pretty well. Um, uh, the apes are actually particularly fast, and uh, at least one, one ape can, can beat most of the undergraduates. And then one I like is strategic thinking. Uh, uh, so Leanne described what's a, what's what economists call a match and pennies game, where you have to match and mismatch. And when the chimps play this, they zero in on the economist's solution, the match equilibrium. The humans systematically miss the solution even when they play repeatedly. So this is a case where when it comes to trying to outmaneuver the other guy, uh, the apes adapt faster. And, and are better at equilibrium. So all this ought to make us wonder about this idea that we're able to survive in diverse environments uh, because of some kind of raw cognitive ability that we see in humans. But of course, this, this begs the obvious question because we, we kind of know that we're smarter than, than non-human primates and chimpanzees and orangutans, so why do we seem so smart? So what I'm going to be laying out here is the case that a lot of what makes us smart is actually a big cultural download. So we cognitively inherit lots of pre-built solutions to problems. So let me give you some, some examples. So uh, tools evolve that, that, have, that embody various concepts of physics, like screws, levers, springs, and pulleys. Once these things exist, you can learn how they work. You can play with them. You can see how they embody various principles. But they're hard to invent the first time. And so one example I'd like to use is the wheel. Uh, a lot of times, from, if, you, if you've got your paleoanthropology from Gary Larson cartoons, Marseille cartoons, you might think that the wheel was invented in the Paleolithic. But it's actually invented relatively late in human history, about 6,000 years ago. Um, only in Eurasia. It's not invented in the New World, except for some Mayan toys, 
not in Australia, not in New Guinea, not in Oceania. Um, and this is despite the fact that you know, these places have dogs and you can easily use dogs and carts. So there's plenty of opportunity, everything needs wheelbarrows. So, so the wheel's a hard thing to invent, but once you have it, you can do potter's wheels, um, uh, you can build pulleys, uh, and of course you can have carts and, and wagons and stuff. Uh, the concept of elastically stored energy never emerges in Australia, nor does the concept of compressed air. But once you have elastically stored energy, you can have bows and arrows and spring traps and all kinds of other devices. So these are things that are hard to invent, but easy to understand and reapply once you have them. So we gradually build up these. So growing it up in our world, you get all this pre-built stuff. One pre-built thing that we get just by learning to speak English is a numbering system that allows us to count without bound. But the small-scale study, uh, society studies by anthropologists count one, two, three, many often. The group I work with in Machigang get counted <coughs> one, two, three, many. Some groups even go a little bit less than that. Um, but you can find a, an amazing variety of counting systems. So some groups can only count to 12, some to 27, some to 36, some to 72. In some places you can do the cycle twice, but, but not 10 times. Um, so you have this immense range of different systems. But once you get the, the full numbering system, you can do cool things like tell 37 cherries from 38 cherries, which is something that's hard to do unless you have the number of two. Spatial cognition. So uh, because if you speak English, you have three different spatial reference systems. So you have north, south, east, and west. You have left and right, which is relatively, it's actually hard to learn about right. It's a lot of kids to learn it. Some of us never learn it. I still have to remember that my watch is on my left hand. Um, and there's another one where you can draw a line between yourself and an object or a pole, and you can say, I'll meet you to the left of the flagpole or to the right of the flagpole. And that's called the relative system. Not all groups have that. Some groups just do north, south, east, and west. So they can't use the right, left trick. So that once you have that, you can, there's lots of applications. Finally, languages. So um, professors have about 70,000 words in their vocabulary. Uh, undergraduates apparently have, this is actually a fact from Paul. So, uh, undergraduates have a, have a few, a couple 10,000, 20,000 words less in their vocabulary. This is an immense number of words, and you realize that the languages of lots of small scale scholars just have three to 5,000. So just the in the head vocabulary of modern English speakers is orders of magnitude higher than the entire lexicon of small scale societies. Okay, and I mentioned this part, this, the, the part about, you know, all this stuff is being learned and it's making us smarter as we acquire it. And all this stuff is a product of cultural evolution. We already know this stuff varies across living populations in the world today. So apes don't get the data. So it's not our intelligence that allows us, our raw individual intelligence, but it's this cultural system. Because because we learn from each other, and the way we learn each, from each other builds cultural ad adaptations. Complex, functionally integrated uh, products that are products of cultural evolution that allow us to adapt to diverse environments. One of the keys to this is not our ability to individually figure out problems, but high fidelity invitation. We have to be able to look out into the world and copy with high fidelity from other members of our social group. And this might involve lots of different um, cognitive tools. Sociality. The system doesn't work if you live alone. So if you're, if you're an island, you don't get to learn from anybody. So the more sociality you have, the more you can energize this process. And the two things together, fidelity and sociality, give rise to this notion of collective brains. So larger, more interconnected groups, theory says, ought to have more complex toolkits, larger toolkit repertoires, say more words, fancier grammatical systems. Um, anything that's cultural ought to, ought to be affected by this. All right, so I'll, I'll be talking about the, the collective brain idea, and then finally is the cultural brain hypothesis. And this is the idea that the massive expansion that human brains have, have experienced in the last two million years has been driven by this, this process of cumulative culture that runs faster or slower depending on the size of the population. Um, as our brains adapt to needing to acquire this cultural stuff and also being affected by its products. And I'll give some specific examples. Okay. Now, now I'm going to move on to the, to the next step, which is to say, okay, so this culture is important, and that's fine, but how do we get it? How do we begin to build a theory of culture? So now we want to apply the logic of natural selection to think about how learners should learn. So what kind of cues should they pay, pay attention to in figuring out who to learn from? So one way to think about this is to suppose you're a novel entrance, so maybe you're a young person growing up, or maybe you've moved to a new environment. You have to figure out what to do. Well, you could do what the camels did in Australia and go around the environment sampling different kinds of foods and using taste cues, and this would allow you to eventually hone in on, on a good enough diet. 
Or you could look out into your social milieu and focus on some of the healthiest members and the most successful members of the group, and, and preferentially eat whatever they eat. And that would allow you to jump to a, um, particularly uh, to a healthy diet. It might not be the best possible diet, but at least it's um, healthier than going through this individually costly sampling process. Okay, so that's uh, just described a cultural learning method. And of course, one of the commitments to this approach to doing it is to formally model these things, to think about under what conditions should we use these different cues to figure out how to do it. Now, uh, one of the things I just alluded to there was model-based mechanisms. So using cues to figure out who to learn from. So health, success, things like that. These are things that have to do with the individual um, as opposed to the type of thing you're learning. But I, I'm going to go into more detail on that, uh, cues to the individual. <coughs> But before that, I just want to mention that we want to think about this as cross-cut with content-based mechanisms. So things that were important over human evolutionary history, we might have a particular inclination to pay attention to. Or we might have some innate, uh, reliably developing inferential machinery that allows us to learn more rapidly than we might otherwise. So some domains I talk about in the book are learning about food, where clearly everywhere I've lived, from the Amazon to the South Pacific, people are keenly interested in food. Um, it seems to be true in our own society. Uh, fire, kids at a certain age seem to be particularly interested in learning about fire. Artifacts, inferences we bring to learning about artifacts. Social norms, what are the rules in my social world? What am I going to assume about those rules? Different kinds of social groups and living kind. So kind of the, the idea of, of folk biology. So we've done work, for example, in Fiji showing that kids learn in one trial about which animals are dangerous when they introduce them to, to new animals. It takes them longer to learn about the habitat the animal lives in and other facts about the habitat. So they're keyed into a certain kind of information. OK, so thinking about developing the theory about who learners should pay attention to, so cues of confidence or skill. If you're growing up in a hunter-gatherer group, say you want to be a good hunter, you should focus on the guy who, whose arrows tend to hit the prey, or who tends to bring back the biggest game. Um, you might also use cues of prestige. So prestige is a kind of second order cue. It means you're looking at who others are paying attention to and deferring to. And you're using that to figure out and help you triangulate in on who to pay attention to. So those are, those are three types of cues. Um, health, health or positive affect at a certain age predicts health at a later age, so that's a good cue. And age can be an important cue. So if you're a young learner, say a five-year-old, you probably don't want to copy the, the best, um, the best hunter would be between 35 and 40 in the hunter-gatherer group, because his skills are way beyond your level. You've got to scaffold yourself up. So you might pay attention to the best seven-year-old or the best nine-year-old. And so you can use a kind of age cue to scaffold yourself up. It's also the case that older people have, have had a lifetime of both individual and social learning. So they're also likely to have um, more useful information. One of the things that, that people forget is that not everybody gets to be old. So natural selection is filtering out some people. So if you're looking at the senior members of your community, you're looking at a sub-selected uh, group of the guys who made it or the people who made it. And so that, again, has information content that, that our, our mental mechanisms can take advantage of. There also may be uh, reasons to use cues of self-similarity. So you want to get the information that's most likely to be useful to you later in life. So males might copy uh, males and females might copy females if the sexual division of labor is at all old. At least some daily anthropologists think it is. Um, we also might use cues of dialect uh, or ethnicity in order, because those are the individuals we're going to need to coordinate, intermarry with. Uh, there's lots of endogamy in the anthropological record. So all these can be ways to get the, get the most useful information for your future. And the idea is that individuals can aggregate this. Now we made these predictions in the in the late 90s. And uh, we kind of put together the available evidence at the time. And I was really delighted that sort of imitation exploded after we made all the imitation studies in developmental psychology exploded after we made these predictions. And there's now quite a bit of evidence, especially from you know, children and even babies, uh, providing evidence for many of these cues. So certainly for success, confidence, reliability, for success, some evidence for age, a little bit for health, a bit for affect. Um, Evidence for sex bias and ethnic cues, so kids preferentially learn those who speak their own dialect or the dialect that mom speaks, language or dialect. Okay. Um, in working with Sue Birch, uh, my collaborators and I have done work on prestige cues, so kids cueing in on the who others are paying attention to, and preferentially about food and about how to use different tools. 
Okay, and humans seem to be able to use these across the vast uh, uh, wide range of different areas. So food preferences, important for mate choice, technological adoption. Uh, one of my favorite examples that I use in the book is suicide. So suicide spreads through, uh, spreads through social networks. It's clearly, well, it's hard to make the case that it's adaptive in most cases. So it's a maladaptive behavior, but we're powerful enough for cultural learners that we can acquire it. And when celebrities, prestigious celebrities, commit suicide, not only is there a rash of people committing suicide who wouldn't have otherwise committed suicide, but they tend to match the celebrity on gender and ethnicity. Um, so you can see these things playing out in the transmission of suicide. And of course, for those of you interested in social and moral behavior, there's now evidence in both children and adults, I think I saw some this morning, that uh, people will readily acquire social motivation, social preferences via cultural transmission. Okay, so this seems to be, uh, you can see, you can, there's evidence of this in one-year-olds, so there seems to be something reliably developing. We find these patterns in Fiji, so it's been tested in at least somewhat diverse societies. And one of my favorite things was in the 90s, economists used to say, well, all those effects will go away once you put people under incentives. But then a bunch of experimental economists put the incentives and everything gets stronger. Because there's more payoffs on the lines of people paying more attention to how they're acquiring their information. Okay. So now the next step is to say, okay, so individuals are using these adaptive learning heuristics, then what happens? Well, so now you've got to move from the individual psychological level and aggregate information. So you can build models where individuals are learning from each other. And what you find uh, is that you can give rise to cultural adaptation. So just think about every generation, people tend to copy the more successful, the guy who's making the better tool or the healthier individuals. If you do this over generations, you can assemble uh, cultural packages which no individual figures out or even recognizes as evolving. It's happening unconsciously, uh, but it's getting better and better and more adapted to, to local circumstances. So I'm going to give you some examples of these in a second. Well, here are some, some, some general examples. So this applies to tools, dietary repertoires, uh, ecological knowledge, medical knowledge. Okay, I mentioned that this is operating outside conscious awareness, although if it is conscious, that's okay. Uh, just that it doesn't have to be conscious. It's not required. It's not rational decision making that's going on. What's interesting, it'll produce things that look like they're products of rational calculation that individuals figured out. Because they'll be well fit to the environment. They'll look designed. Uh, what's getting transmitted here are procedures and sub goals. Uh, the causal understanding are only figured out after the fact. So one of my favorite examples from the history of recent, well, as we think recent is, but the steam engine. The invention of the steam engine seemed to have been largely came about from tinkering. But once you had the steam engine, it gives you a window onto the world of thermodynamics. And then it, it, the thermodynamics, uh, when our understanding of thermodynamics got increased by having a steam engine that one can study. But the steam engine came first. So things like boomerangs, uh, are still not completely understood by aerospace engineers. This is a project I did in undergraduate. So unless maybe someone's figured out since then. Uh, but they're, they're very complex aerodynamics, it turns out. And of course, many medicines, we know they work, and we're still trying to back out why. This turns out to be generally true. So it's not causal understandings that are driving. <coughs> okay. And in some cases, I think it's really important that people not understand the causes. So causal understanding could be a negative. And so two examples, one would be ritual. So rituals seem to evolve in at least some places to build solidarity amongst groups. But if people knew they were just doing the ritual in order to build solidarity and not to satisfy the god or whatever supernatural thing, then they might be less likely to do the ritual. Um, and I give another example about the use of divination practices and hunting, which seems like it wouldn't work if people understood what was actually going on. Okay, to give you uh, one example that, that may, uh, may be more intuitive, there's work by uh, Jennifer Billings and Paul Sherman on spices. And uh, spices, the, the pattern they see globally to spices is that it's most important in hot climates and other heat recipes. And so, and then if you test the spices that are most frequently used in these places, they seem to have antimicrobial properties. And in fact, the way they're prepared, spice by spice, seems to suggest that they're being prepared in ways that at least don't decrease and, it, and sometimes increase their antimicrobial properties. So spicing appears to be an adaptation to reducing the pathogens in meat. But of course, people just like spices. And something like the ch chili pepper, humans seem to have an innate aversion to them. Uh, babies won't eat chili peppers, and chimpanzees won't eat chili peppers. 
But if you grow up in a world where people seem to eat chili peppers and like them, you can learn to enjoy that pain channel that's being activated by the capsaicin in chili peppers. So we can, we can turn uh, pain into pleasure, in the case of chili peppers, uh, via cultural learning, by, by acquiring this idea. And this helps us use this cultural adaptation, which spice users themselves don't actually understand. Another example I use in the book is the, the pudding of ash. It's a process called mixed caramelization in your cornmeal. So uh, here in Texas, you, you get a corn tortilla. It's probably been, uh, traditionally anyway, you use ash in the mix. And that's because it releases the niacin in corn that would otherwise be unavailable. And if you're a population dependent on corn, it prevents you from getting a heart disease called fall. We know this is almost impossible to figure out because when the Europeans transported corn over to Europe, they dropped the ash out of the recipe and there was epidemics of pelagra all over Europe and went on, and went on for decades. Okay, so those are examples of some cultural adaptations. So just to give you a sense of where we're at, so genetic evolution produces our psychological capacity for cultural learning as well as other aspects of our psychology, of course there's other aspects. And this can then give rise to things like the complex tools, behavioral repertoires like the spicing recipes, uh, ritual practices, and social norms and institutions. And it's this complex of cultural products that can be used to understand uh, our cultural psychology. So people in different societies process information in different ways, they have different pat patterns of attention, they have different biases and heuristics, and so there's cultural psychological variation across society. Now, of course, once you produce the cultural psychology, it can then affect social learning and alter the which institutions evolve and get this interactive process. And of course, in the long run, it's going to affect genetic evolution. And I'll say more about that in a few minutes. Okay, so now I'm going to make a, a point, and this is just a kind of a common thing that you hear uh, folks in the evolutionary, human evolutionary sciences say. And, um, I heard that Paul Bloom was giving the introduction, so I took out the quote from Pinker and Bloom, 1992, where they say exactly the same thing, and I put in this David Buster and the David King. <laughs> uh, so, so natural selection is the only known causal process capable of producing complex functional mechanisms. And one of the points I make in the book is that I agree, I mean, I'm equally impressed with these guys in terms of the power of natural selection acting on genes to construct uh, elegant, uh, functionally integrated mechanisms. But I also think that there's, a, there's, another, there's another inherent system which can also do that now, and I've been giving you examples of those, with the chili peppers and um, the, the corn example. Um, so you can see them. So this unconscious process of cultural evolution can also produce adaptations that are functionally integrated, built to solve local adaptive problems, and evolve. Um, and they also alter our biology. So the one, the case that really puts this down is the evolution of writing systems. So writing systems evolved over thousands of years, and we now know from work in neuroscience that when you learn to read, it actually alters uh, air in your left hemisphere to create what the hand calls a letterbox, and it thickens the corpus callosum, um, does a number of other brain alterations. So you know, it changes our organic structure. So you can actually look at it, the evolution of the frequency of, of reading in Europe, and you're actually watching corpus callosum get thicker. Right, so you're watching biological non-genetic evolution. Okay. All right, uh, and to keep in mind, natural selection can also act on cultural variation. So there's nothing about Darwin's principles that mean it can't, it can't act on other kinds of inherent systems. Now, to put, to put a, a sharper point on this, I'd like to use this example of the village weaver. So the village weaver is a bird um, in Africa, and uh, it builds this, this nest in a very stylized way. So it always uses these knots you see here, and um, there's always a series of steps. <coughs> and then you get a, this is a nicely designed nest. So other predator birds will try to get through this nest, but it resists them. They can't crawl in through the bottom, one, because it's at the bottom, two, because it's too narrow for most of the large predator birds to come in. This nest is designed to reinforce so that it can drop out of the tree and then the eggs still survive. So it's got, it's got a lot of um, adaptive features. It's not learned. The bird's not required to have seen any other birds in their lifetime. They're just able to build this artifact. And uh, this is an Inuit snow house, uh, which is, is a complex, thermodynamically uh, interesting uh, product that the makers of the snow house themselves don't understand. So there's interesting thermodynamics about how you face this long tunnel entrance, the thermodynamic properties of snow, um, and it's, you use rendered seal oil to heat it because, of course, there's no wood in the bar, so you need one of these guys in order to get the 
fuel for this. Uh, this is a, a bone tool that you use in order to create the snow blocks. It seems not intuitive to me that if you want to get warm, you would build a snow house. So anyway, so one is a product of cultural evolution operating over generations, adapting the primate species to life in the Arctic, and the other is genetic evolution, creating a house for a bird. So two kinds of housing structures um, produced by two different kinds of inheritance systems. Okay, now I just want to put a, a little bit of a, a finer point on this. So um, there's also culturally evolved cognitive adaptations, and I've already given you some examples. So I've been focusing on tools, but I think it's important to remember that this stuff is always integrated with changes to our brains and, and different cognitive abilities. So I've given you number systems, you can think about math, um, spatial reference systems. And um, so what you want to think about is that uh, these systems are adapting to reliably developing their innate aspects of our psychology, but they're augmenting it and, 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 and altering it in different ways. So you can get a sense from that by thinking about the spatial reference systems and the numbers. Uh, one of the examples I like is the mental abacus. And uh, if you've ever seen children perform <coughs> the mental abacus, they can do extraordinary computational, adding long lists of, digit, of, of uh, you know, five, six, seven digit numbers in a rel relatively short period of time. And one of the impressive things is they don't have an abacus in front of them, but they appear to be looking off into space and they're moving their fingers around as if they're sliding the beads. So the first thing you do is you have to have the evolution of the abacus, which seems to have spacing that really is fit to our, our visuospatial system. So there's a certain number of, of objects that can be individually uh, remembered in certain positions that aren't too far apart. So it's a, it's a piece of technology that has evolved to fit aspects of our, our visual system. But then if you use that enough, you can put it away. And you can just have a picture of this device in your head. And then you can make these amazing calculations. Uh, a variety of research on this suggests that it's, um, it's not linguistically supported at all. So this is a visual spatial process that these kids are doing. The only thing dealing with language that they need is to, to give the answer at the end. So it's a non-linguistic mental adaptation that gives amazing cognitive abilities, but it's a kind of prosthesis that fits onto our existing visual spatial abilities. Now another one that I'll talk more about is that should think of language as the same way. So of course we have lots of innate structure in our brain and language has to deal with that. But language is evolved to fit our brains. Now our brains may also be evolving to better fit languages, but culture evolves a lot faster and so it can fit our brains. So things like um, color terms, just in our own society, the rate at which, so the point is, is that uh, languages vary in how difficult they are for kids to learn. So not all kids are equally good at languages at the same age. It takes some kids longer to learn their native tongue and other certain, certain parts of it. Something like color terms in our own society, uh, 50 years ago, used to be learned a lot later by children. But somehow American parents have figured out ways to, to jam those color terms into their kids' heads at younger and younger ages. So it's this, this cultural system figuring out ways to get the things that kids need. Languages that weren't learned by children would have been left on the junk heap of uh, cultural evolution. So one sort of toy example that I think is useful is to think about gloves. Um, so gloves evolved to fit our hands, and we can understand the structure and, and adaptation of gloves by uh, thinking about how they evolved to fit our hands. The tricky part about cognitive adaptations, unlike the glove, is we can tell where, where the genetic stuff ends and the cultural stuff begins. Um, the problem with lots of mental adaptations is it's hard to figure out where one begins and the other, the other ends. Okay, so now I'm going to talk a little bit about the collective brain. And uh, so I want to give you some, some evidence. So this is research, start with some evidence. It's some research done by Rob Boyd and Michelle Klein. And what they did is they measured the number and complexity of tools in 10 islands around the Pacific. Now the Pacific is a great place to do this because the, the islands are separated from each other. So you get semi-discrete populations. Of course, we know that there was you know, sailing and movement and uh, people and languages across these islands. But you get a sense of, you get a certain amount of isolation that has an influence. And um, using the collective brain idea as the theory, they expected that the logarithm of the population size would predict uh, the complexity and the number of tools. And this is the results they found. Um, I mean, it's this formal theory, right? So the, so the logarithm is not something they did in order to fit the data. The logarithm was the prediction from the theory. Uh, and you can see the number of tools is closely predicted by the size. And, um, as well as the mean techno units per tool. So 
So the mean technical units is just a rough and ready measure of the number of different parts that go into the tool. So with larger islands, with more people, tended to have more complicated tools. Now you can do lots of uh, tests for other kinds of variables, ecological variables, um, richness, <coughs> things like that. Um, none of that seems to, sh to shape the spacing result. You can also look for islands that are more or less in contact. And the islands that were more in contact tended to be above the regression line, so suggesting that contact was increasing. These are both consistent with the theory. It's the size of the population and the interconnectedness that allows the machinery of cultural evolution to generate these, these fancy products. Now, I always point this out for my friends in paleoanthropology, so I'm not sure if it's interesting to this group. But when paleoanthropologists dig up tools, they'll often make inferences about how smart a species was by looking at the complexity of the tool. But if you look at these Austronesian speakers here in Hawaii, and down here, I think this is uh, Manaus or something, um, you wouldn't want to infer the, the cognitive, the innate complexity of these two people, these two ends of the Austronesian expansion, all modern humans, no reason to expect any cognitive differences, on the basis of their tools. The guys in Hawaii were able to generate fancier tools because they were living in larger populations. They were able to share information. They turned the crank of cultural evolution faster. So you can't read cognitive complexity from cultural products. <coughs> Okay, now I'm going to give you a field example from this. So I've shown you a little bit of data. And these are uh, stone tools made by four different populations. And so I asked my undergraduates, tell me which of these tools are the oldest and which of these tools are the most recently created. They almost always say that tools on the top, one of the two sets of tools on the top, were the most recently created. And so one is Upper Paleolithic Europe, 35,000 years ago, and the other are Australian Aborigines, around 1700. Now the bottom, these are the oldest tools by far. So the one in the red circle is an a, a old one hand axe, and the other tools are two uh, Mysterian, often associated with Neanderthals. Uh, so relatively old stuff. Now who are these other tools? Well, these tools were made by Tasmanians in, in 1700 roughly. So these are two contemporary populations that are only separated by the Bass Strait. So uh, Tasmanians and islands, two-thirds the size of Ireland, off the coast of Victoria in Australia. Uh, so it's strange that these one group is making quite sophisticated stone tools, and the other group is making tools that are hard to differentiate from uh, Mysterian ancient stone tools you find in the rest. Okay, why would that be? Well, first let me tell you a little bit more about Tasmania. So it's an island of hunter-gatherers. Uh, it's the European show up about 1642. And this is the simplest technology uh, the Tasmanians had that were ever encountered by Europeans as they expanded across the world. So similar than folks in Tierra del Fuego, way simpler than anything in Africa, um, this by far the simplest. Clothing was a one-piece wallet and skins. Okay, so uh, what's even when you dig deeper, it gets even more puzzling because it seems that the Tasmanians not only had a simple technology when the Europeans arrived, but they probably had a more complex set of tools 10,000 years prior, and they seem to lose tools over time. So they certainly lost a bunch of stuff associated with fishing, and a number of bone tools, probably cold weather clothing. And there's a bunch of things they, nearly, they never developed that we're sure that the Australian Aborigines had. So um, uh, half the tools, nets, fishing spears, barbed spears, spear throwers, durable watercraft, and boomerangs are just a small subset of the things that were just across the Bass Strait in uh, Victoria. So this is a this is watercraft of the Tasmanians, simple rafts, very leaky, and no paddles. So they actually had, when the Tasmanians had to cross rivers, they would have the man and the children get on the raft, and the woman would grease herself down with animal grease, jump in the water, and swim the from the raft across. And you can see the drinking vessel was uh, skulls. Okay. All right. So. Uh, estimates vary, but Rice Jones, the archaeologist, who's the expert here, estimates about 24 items in the Tasmanian toolkit. That leaves out some stuff. But. All right. Now, I mentioned that just across the Bass Strait, there are these more complex tools. Uh, and so this is so they had sewn bark canoes, string bags, round edge axes, wooden bowls for drinking, um, of course, boomerangs, I mentioned, a variety of composite tools, specialized nets for different kinds of species, fish, birds, and wallabies. See, that's a, that's a fishing net there on the bottom. So uh, half the tools which the Tasmanians lost. So the question is, how could you, how could we explain losing such valuable technology? 
And the case that I've made that it has to do with uh, geological change, climatic change. So the uh, last glacial maximum is 18,000 years ago, where it starts warming. By 12,000 years ago, Tasmania begins to get cut off from the rest of mainland Australia. So it was a peninsula connected to the rest of Australia, and eventually becomes an island. And then once it becomes an island, you get this disappearance of, of technology. So the technology gradually ebbs away. And so the idea is, is that the, the size of the collective brain shrunk. It was able to share information across all along the coast of Australia and in a continental population, and it shrinks down to just this one island. And so they lose all this. They're going through a new equilibrium. So I built some, some mathematical models of this, and you can actually calculate with some simplifying assumptions that there's a critical threshold of which, above which, if your population is big enough, so that's n. If your population is big enough, you enter a, re a regime of cumulative cultural evolution. So your technology gets fancier and fancier. And if something happens that causes you to drop below this, late case, you can actually enter a negative. Uh, regime, which will go to a new, lower, uh, less complex set of technologies. And so the idea is that the Tasmanians, when they got cut off, uh, dropped into the negative regime and had to go to this, this lower technological equilibrium. Okay, now of course that's just uh, fitting the model to, to a historical case. It's not going to establish causality. So to establish causality, we went to the psychology laboratory. So this is joint work with Michael Rufu Krishna. Um, former graduate student of mine, and we tried to recreate these processes to test these theories in the laboratory to establish causality. So what we did is we used, might have used uh, undergraduates at UBC, and we had 10 generations in which one generation could try to figure out a hard problem, pass whatever they learned down to the next generation, who could then do their thing, and pass that down to the next generation. And we did this in two different ways. One is the individual condition, where you can only learn from one person in the previous generation. And the other, you can learn from anybody, all five of the other individuals in the previous generation. And the prediction is straightforward. When you're more interconnected in this group, you should be able to generate more rapid uh, increase in skill or technological complexity. So uh, I'm gonna, the first one I'm going to show you, we're going to start with naive, unskilled individuals and see if this cultural stuff accumulates. And then we're going we're to go to experts and see if we can get a Tasmanian effect by going down. So in this experiment, learners had to use a complex image editing program to try to replicate uh, this thing here. And so we can measure their skill by how close their drawing is to this. So we can use all kinds of similarity measures to, to get that. And in order to do this, they have a time limit, and they get paid for how good their answer is. They also get paid for how good their student's answer is, so the similarity between their student product and that. So they're fully incentivized. After they finish the task, they can write up to two pages that gets passed down to the student. So, so the student gets the model's product, which allows them to assess, to, to assess how good the model was, as well as the two-page writer. Uh, and of course, they, everybody sees the targeting, so they all know what they're going for. And then, so this is, uh, here on the horizontal, there's 10 laboratory generations. This is the mean skill rating. And uh, so, in the, when you can only learn from one person in the prior generation, so you were constrained from, from tapping all these models, uh, the skill never went anywhere. They just kind of evolved around here. Interestingly, these guys had a good first round. So, the, so by chance, the, the first group that did it did really well, um, but it doesn't go anywhere. Meanwhile, these guys didn't do so well, but the, the power of cumulative cultural evolution kicked in, and by the end, this this group is on average a lot more skilled than this group. Now you can really see it. This is actually the data. Um, so there's the target image. This is the first generation. Down here is the tenth generation. And this is when you can see five models, and this is when you can see one model. So you can see here in the first generation, uh, these guys did pretty well. And they're not doing too bad, but then it doesn't get passed on much, and then these guys are just kind of flopping around. These guys do terrible. Um, I don't know what this guy's doing. <laughs> but this guy kind of gets something, and then this guy gets it, and then all these guys get it, and then these things just start rocking and rolling from there. And by the end here, every single person in the 10th generation is better than the best person and the other just over the ten generations of skill. Now, when we put experts in, we used a different, we used a not time task in this case. We wanted something more ecologically valid, so they had a complex, they had to tie a complex system of rock climbing knots. So when you could access five models, you had a decline in skill, but it was less. And you seem to hit an equilibrium skill level here, where you don't get any lower. 
Here you drop faster and you hit a lower level with equilibrium. So it looks like these guys are going to be stuck at two different skill levels because of the amount of interconnectedness between the populations. So that provides a direct test uh, the causality of interconnectedness in generating skill. It has been of course, people who are randomly assigned to treatment groups show you don't have to worry about intelligence or incentives. It's just the difference in the sociality of the drugs. Okay, now um, I've emphasized tools and stuff, but this should apply to any domain of culture. So I'm going to very briefly point out that languages are products of, of cultural evolution too. You can think of them as words or sets of tools, they're composed of parts called phonemes, and they're further allocated using syntax or grammar. The goal is communication, uh, so cultural evolution is going to produce adaptations for communication in diverse environments. Um, now, there's a little bit of evidence suggesting that, in fact, the, the sound qualities of the environment to which you're adapting to uh, affects language. So, languages in warmer climates use more sonorous vowels, which allows you to communicate over long distances when you're outside uh, in warmer climates. But I think the more interesting, for my purposes, is these same things apply to different aspects of languages. So, in the same way that larger, more interconnected groups should have more complex tools, they should also have more complex languages. Uh, so more words, for example, there was a recent paper in the NAS which showed that in Polynesia, larger societies had gained more words compared to the, to the uh, earlier language, and uh, smaller populations lost more words more rapidly. So small populations tend to lose more, large populations tend to gain more. And I'll show you data on phone names and information. Okay, so this is, there's several studies. Uh, I'm just showing you two here. This is Quentin Atkinson. This is just a plot of uh, 50 families. You can do this in all kinds of ways. Quentin is very concerned about controlling for language phylogeny. But larger speaker communities have more phoneme diversity. They have a larger number of phonemes to work with. Um, human languages vary from 11 phonemes. There's a couple of caveats there. In one society, the men have more phonemes than the women. Uh, up to 140 different phonemes. English has 32, I believe. And um, uh, societies with more phonemes tend to have shorter words, which allows you to use shorter words. This is another study from 2007 that found the same thing. Different data sets, We're all using different data sets. All right, and then finally, this one is potentially more interesting, uh, but it's, it's, it's a preliminary result, so I don't want to put too much on this. But, um, there was a paper not too long ago looking at the optimization for information content in different languages. And you can only do this on languages that have a large written corpus. You need to be able to analyze the, the written corpus and then see to what degree, if you know the few words before a word, can you predict what that word is going to be. So how predictable is the next word? More efficient languages are less predictable. Otherwise, you're, you're, sort, of, you're sort of being redundant. And so uh, what this analysis shows is that larger speaker communities have more optimization. So there's, there's more information content per, per word, per, 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 uh, per word. Okay. Now, this put, puts out another sort of, I can, I can put on my, my, my weird, weird people hat here uh, about English. So um, English is, I think, using these kinds of data, definitely the weirdest language in the world. It has by far the most number of words. So the Oxford English Dictionary has 400,000 words. I mentioned English speakers have 60, 70,000 words in their, in their in the head vocabulary. With Spanish, it has a really high, and I mean, this is all the data we have on this, so it's one of the two highest in terms of uh, informational efficiency. And of course, it's morphologically simple. And the, the languages of small scale societies tend to be morphologically uh, complex. Um, so English uses lots of uh, single words rather than pushing all the words together and using fixes on uh, different kinds of grammatical systems. So the languages that humans, it's also non-tonal. So if you had to make a guess about the languages that humans spoke over most of human evolutionary history, they would have three to 5,000 words in their vocabulary, uh, 60 or 70,000. They would be morphologically complex, uh, and they would be tonal. So all things that don't apply to English. So if you're studying language development in humans, it's, it's worth knowing that. <laughs> okay, okay, so that's the, the collective brain idea that the size and interconnectedness of the population um, affects rates of cultural evolution. Now I just want to say that this applies deep back into human evolutionary history. And that the way to understand how our species took this strange trajectory, the strange evolutionary trajectory, is that 
I have a whole chapter that is kind of ambiguous about when exactly uh, uh, we cross this threshold, I call the Rubicon, to this cumulative cultural evolutionary process. I think it happened probably two million years ago, but I mean, it's the paleoanthropological record. It's not very precise. So sometime, a long time ago, um, humans began to have cumulative cultural evolution. And so uh, once you can begin this cumulative process, you generate fancier tools like cooking and fire, tracking techniques and ways of processing food and shelter and clothing, knowledge of medicinal plants. And, uh, and then the more that information you have, the more you need a brain that's capable of acquiring, storing, organizing, and retransmitting that information. But then the better you are at that, the more that cultural information you get. But then when you get more information, you have a selection pressure to have a brain that's even better at doing all that stuff. So you create this uh, autocatalytic process where when you get better at culture, then you get more cultural information, which means that as a learner, trying to figure out something by yourself would be crazy because you're much more likely to get something useful by looking around your social milieu and finding someone uh, uh, who's particularly good at it or successful at it. So this is how you become a cultural species, and we went down this autocatalytic process. As soon as far as we know, no other species has crossed this cumulative cultural evolutionary barriers. So this is why humans seem to be alone on this, although we probably haven't always been alone. I think Neanderthals and some of our cousin species were, were on the same track. We just, we just eliminated them all. Um, now, of course, our genetic evolution, the size of our brain, tends to stop. So humans seem to have some, some probably phylogenetic constraints on how big the baby's head can be before birth. Before it's born, so selection has tried to do what it can. It you know crumples the baby's head up. Uh, it's, women's pelvises have been modified to allow the baby to, to, to get out sooner and massively expands after it comes out. Uh, but there are certain constraints there. But of course, the cultural evolutionary system has kept cranking out information, and this led to a division of labor. So in the book, I make the case that the division of labor between males and females is actually the first division of labor. It's a division of information. It's kind of like you're going to be a specialist in this one kind of information. I'm not going to be a specialist in this other information. All right, um, so that's the, the so th this is meant to address this puzzle uh, of how it was, why in roughly two million years, human brains expanded <coughs> to three times the prior size. Now, um, this cultural evolutionary, cumulative cultural evolutionary process is also, besides producing this information which has to be acquired by the brains, it's also putting out lots of other products that have shaped our um, physiology, anatomy, and uh, psychology. So let me give you one example here, um, fire and cooking. So my colleague Richard Rankin uh, has argued, I think persuasively, that fire and cooking has shaped our physiology. So if you look at our, the size of our stomachs, the length of our colons, the size of our teeth, all these seem too small for a primate who eats our diet and of our body size. But if you recognize that we're a, a cooking species, that we pre-digest our food through food processing and cooking, um, then it makes sense because you can, there's a lot of energy used by these digestive uh, systems. And if you can pre-digest your food using cultural know-how, uh, then you can you know, use that energy for other things like, like brain building. Now, the thing that's been underemphasized uh, in this argument <coughs> is that humans, we don't innately know how to make fire. We're not innately cooks. We have to learn these things. So culture of uh, how to make fire and cooking spreads culturally, and then this then creates a selection pressure on our bodies that reduces the size of our stomach, shrinks our colons, shrinks our teeth. So it's a, it's a gene culture interaction. Um, there's a lot of work, for example, uh, some of it done by people in this room on uh, folk biological know-how, so we seem to have a specialized system for acquiring, storing, and making use of knowledge about plants and animals. So it's the kind of system that only makes sense if you're getting this massive download of knowledge about plants and animals. Uh, another interesting one is uh, my, my other colleague, uh, Van Lieberman, has made the case that humans have evolved to be long distance runners. That unlike primates, we have springy arches which store energy, but only when we're running. We have a nuchal ligament that uh, other running animals have, like horses, but that other primates don't have. It allows our head to turn independent of our torso. Um, we have various adaptations to our hips. And all these make it look like we're evolved for long distance running. And so Dan's argument is that we were pursuit, that we're pursuit hunters. We can actually, we know this from hunter gatherers, we can run so long that we can cause an antelope or some other uh, undulate to just collapse and keep exhaustion, and we're still going, going, uh, going well. One of the key parts of this adaptation is our sweating system. So unlike other primates, we have a massive number of atrium sweat glands, 
And this pours cooling water out over our bodies. And the speed at which we run is just fast enough to create a cooling sensation that allows us to, to endure all this heat. But if you look at this system like an engineer, there's a big problem with it. There's no water tank. Now you might say, well, other animals don't have a water tank. It turns out they do. Um, horses and camels can consume massive amounts of water, uh, but humans can't. In fact, we're, we're pretty poor in terms of our ability to consume water. But we do have cultural know-how. So we can make external water containers, and we can know, we know where to find uh, water-laden plants, underground uh, water sources, a whole bunch of cultural knowledge that goes with uh, finding water. Now, when you study hunter-gatherers engaging in persistence hunting, this is actually how they get their water. They, they can use various skins. Uh, Australian Aborigines actually use the big, long bamboo tubes that they string around their backs, and they know where to find water. So this is a this is a culture gene package. It requires this cultural know-how, which doesn't come in aid, but then it led to changes in our, in our feet, in our nuchal ligaments, and in these other uh, atrium swipe glands. Now, um, there's lots of other domains, so we make artifacts, and that gives us an artifact cognition. Um, I argue that humans have two kinds of uh, status, prestige and dominance, but you can only get to prestige if you have cultural know-how that's distributed around uh, other members of your group, and then you can figure out who has that, and then you pay them deference as part of this prestige thing. So it gives rise to the second system of status that I think humans have. The other one is social norms. So once you can learn from each other, you can learn rules of certain behavior, and you can learn uh, the standards by which others must perform culturally. Once you have those two things, you can get social norms, and now individuals have to comply with groups that have come to share standards for judging others. And then people get punished if they violate the rules, and this can give rise to enormous psychology. A psychology that says, well, I'm in this world, there's going to be rules. If I break the rules, I'll get a bad reputation. So I want to assume there are rules, and then I have some inferential machinery that allows me to learn the rules. Uh, and, then, and then finally, um, <coughs> ethnic categorization. So I mentioned earlier that humans uh, use dialect to figure out who to learn from. And uh, it seems to be a prioritized cue. So actually back, well, going back into the 80s and then Richard Gallarat in the early 2000s, there's a simple gene culture co-evolutionary model where cultural evolution goes first. And it creates groups that have norms and are marked by some kind of marker trait. And then in the wake of that cultural evolution, you get genes that help you navigate a world where there are different groups that are marked by different traits, language, dress, and they have different rules, and you've got to figure out which group you're in and which rules to pay attention to. So this can give rise to a kind of folk, folk sociology. All right, so this is just to give you a sense of you know, how, how gene culture co-evolution can organize our inquiry into different aspects <coughs> of, of human psychology. Okay. It, it, um, it also predicts a number of oddities about our species. So, um, unlike other species, or so I mentioned this already, so that's why I'm, I'm hesitating. So we had this rapid expansion in our brains over the last two million years, and so you need an autocatalytic process in order to generate that kind of rapid brain expansion. Um, one idea is this Machiavellian intelligence idea that some have championed. Uh, this is an alternative where the autocatalytic uh, process comes from the interaction of the two inherited systems. So a lot of this is about what our theory of minds are for. So Leanne Young earlier talked about you know, for cooperation or for competition. I think those are both wrong. I think our theory of mind is for learning from other members of our social group. So we can key in and figure out what's your strategy, what are you doing, and how can I navigate the world. The first thing kids have to do is massively start learning about their social milieu because you can't, you can't act in a Machiavellian way and then like the rules until you know what the rules are. Um, this it gives us an account of these unusual features of our anatomy and our psychology. I mentioned some of them just a second ago. It predicts this strange pattern of differences among species that I pointed out. Really good at social learning, not so not so different on these other topics. <coughs> Over imitation has gotten a lot of uh, recent work. This is exactly the kind of thing you'd expect in a species that's so dependent on cultural learning. When you have a complex tool. You can't ask the how and why of every different part that goes into the complex tool. You just have to copy all the steps. Uh, and that'll, that'll help you get to the, to, the, to the tool that everybody else is using. Now, once you have that, you can try to make modifications. But um, you wouldn't expect that in a species that did, didn't rely on cumulative cultural evolution. Extended childhood. So you, uh, we have this kind of weird life history where we have really short infancy compared to other apes, but these long period of middle childhood. And, and, and 
this, in this case, that long period of middle childhood where we're wiring up our brains, we're doing cultural learning during that period. So we're adapting our brains to our cultural milieu. And then finally, uh, menopause. Uh, so humans are unusual in that we have this shutdown of our, our female reproductive system. Uh, well, long before, we have this long post uh, period after reproduction that women live. And this seems to be puzzling, but it makes good sense if you think about that long period after menopause as an opportunity to transmit cultural information. So humans should live longer because we can pass on all this information we've accumulated over time. I call it the information grandmother hypothesis. Uh, it's, and so one way to test this is to look at menopause in other species. And so two other species that have menopause or something like menopause are elephants and porco. And in both cases, uh, grandmothers pass on valuable cultural information. So elephants have know-how about, for example, what to do during drought. Um, orca mothers seem to pass on all kinds of useful techniques to, the, to their pods. Okay, uh, so these are just the key points I started with. And the central idea is that we need to think about how culture drove human evolution uh, and took humans on a different, different cultural evolutionary trajectory compared to other species. 